Charlie Munger just reported in his daily journal annual general meeting that he has gone into margin debt to purchase more shares of Alibaba. Although you guys know that I'm a huge Alibaba bull and it's my largest equity position, in this video, I'm going to explain why the Chinese economic story isn't as clear cut as there's a very real slowdown occurring in China, which of course is expected to continue to impact Alibaba. And what exactly am I talking about? I'm talking about the mounting economic costs of China's zero COVID policies, coupled with the very real economic slowdown from the real estate sector. So I hate to be the bringer of bad news, but part of the reason why you guys watch this channel is because I give it to you guys straight. I present the good and the bad. This channel is not an echo chamber. And I don't think that we should be blindly following Munger into this investment without understanding exactly what's going on in the country. So please guys, smash that like button and subscribe if you're new. You're watching more money, let's get it. What's up guys and let's get right into it. According to a report put out in December by the World Bank, the pace of China's economic growth is slowing from pre-pandemic levels and it doesn't look like it's going to get back to those growth levels anytime soon. The report stated that the Chinese economy saw a strong rebound in the first half of 2021 with year-over-year -year growth of 12.7%, which if we're going to be honest just reflected the low comps from the 2020 lockdowns in Q1 and Q2. And as expected, the momentum slowed down in the second half of 2021 with real GDP growth slowing to 4.9% in Q3 of 2021. And the outlook for 2022 isn't much higher than that with the World Bank projecting that the Chinese economy is expected to grow at a rate of 5.1%. And that baseline projection assumes moderate fiscal easing in 2022. So in other words, all of that good news that we've been discussing as it relates to accommodative monetary policy is already priced into the growth forecast for China and is necessary according to the World Bank to achieve that 5.1% GDP growth in the nation. Now, with that said, there's two very important issues that every investor needs to know about China before investing in any company in the country. Those are the ongoing COVID policies and the rising unemployment, which is causing that general economic slowdown that Alibaba mentioned in their Q2 results. And let's dive right into them, starting with the first of the two issues that I want to discuss in this video, the zero COVID policies. The 2022 GDP forecast for China from the World Bank, correctly in my opinion, assumed that China's COVID-19 strategy will remain broadly unchanged for much of the year. China is expected to continue to suppress COVID-19 outbreaks and keep cases at a manageable level to avoid stressing its healthcare system. The restrictions could be gradually relaxed after more than half of the population receives booster shots to improve protection. Note that Omicron and other potential variants may further complicate the exit of the zero COVID strategy, which is what I've mentioned on this channel could be the item that weighs on the normalization of domestic consumption in the country. If you're one of the people that think that the zero COVID policies are having no impacts on the economy, then your opinion runs counter to what the Chinese government themselves believe. The Chinese government is not unaware that these lockdowns are impacting the economy, where between 80 and 90% of the population's is vaccinated. So on Thursday of this past week, we got some relatively good news as the National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC, instructed that all regional authorities not impose any unauthorized citywide or district-wide lockdowns. Yeah, you guys heard that right. In China, while the Olympics were still going on, the abundance of caution approach is going away. The commission also urged local governments not to shut down or extend closure of restaurants, supermarkets, scenic spots, and cinemas without investigation or policy basis. It looks like these new rules are part of the NDRC's efforts to adopt a further targeted approach in virus rules to help services and activities return to normal and let's be honest, guys, we all know why this is happening. They are starting to feel real economic impacts. Let me explain that further for you. 
In January, activity in China's service sector expanded at the slowest pace in the last five months, as a surge in local coronavirus cases and containment measures hit new businesses and consumer sentiment, while employment also fell, according to the Kiaxin and Market Services Purchasing Managers Index. The NDRC also announced more tax incentives for the catering, retail, tourism, and aviation industries. And here's where my spidey senses tingled a little bit. The NDRC is also guiding online food delivery platforms to lower operating costs for the catering businesses by reducing service fees or commissions. So why were the online delivery companies specifically targeted? I believe it's because the country is now seeing fast rising unemployment, which is the second of the two issues that I wanna discuss in this video. My thoughts are that the officials have to find a solution for the increasing number of unemployed people and the gig economy is a good place for them to go in the meantime while the economy recovers. So why not spur delivery demand by forcing the food delivery platforms to lower prices? Of course, this isn't good news for Alibaba or Tencent as they both own food delivery companies. My perspective is that the overall impact is expected to be manageable. A news publication here in Canada, BNN News, has suggested that unemployment in China could be worse than official monthly figures, but I do have to say that this information comes from anecdotal reports and undefined alternative indicators. The report cites that there are four areas of concern. They are trouble in the services sector, shrinking industry, migration issues, and dropouts. And I'm gonna cover those four areas of concern, starting with the trouble in the services sector. The services industry is the biggest source of jobs in China, employing approximately 47% of their labor force. Consumer spending on contact services such as travel, and dining has been consistently weak throughout 2021, making businesses in those sectors reluctant to hire new workers. COVID-related business closures don't just impact the offering of services as we have seen in North America. These closures also have an impact on demand as it does decline during a lockdown as people get concerned with going out. The Employment Sub-Index for China's Non-Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, which tracks hiring intentions in the service and construction sector, has stayed consistently below pre-pandemic levels for most of the past 12 months. The economy created 12 million new urban jobs in the first 11 months of 2021, according to official data, which is below the 12.8 million new jobs created in the same period in 2019. Note that because you have construction related jobs in those figures, the big elephant in the room is if real estate sales are going down and developers are going bankrupt, of course, hiring in that industry is expected to decline. And that doesn't even take into account the downstream and upstream activities related to the real estate sector slowdown. There are a ton of impacts here that aren't even being discussed in that article, but I'll dive further into them with the second area of trouble, which is the shrinking industry. So moving on to the shrinking industry, there are three issues at play here, which include automation, ban on after-school education, and as aforementioned, the real estate sector slowdown. So starting with automation, China's exports boomed during the pandemic and many factories struggled to find workers. But official data has shown a trend of shrinking employment in manufacturing, likely in part due to increased automation. The average number of workers at industrial enterprises with revenues above 20 million yuan fell slightly from 7,419 workers in November of 2020 to 7,398 workers in November of 2021. Although this is a slight decline, according to official statistics, textile and apparel companies saw the largest decline by that measure. So it looks like the natural and anticipated process of productivity improvements are being made, which is reducing the number of employees necessary to run operations, albeit we are at the early stages of it. And I'm not so worried about automation as it does create higher paying service and engineering jobs, but also, you do have to deal with the layoff of factory workers and where exactly do they go to find employment. The second of the three issues at play with the shrinking industry is the ban on after-school education. In 2021, the CCP caused huge turmoil in the after-school tutoring business when they stated that the after-school tutoring industry must become a non-profit industry 
and capital involvement in kindergarten to grade nine education is strictly prohibited. You guys may remember the tanking in the share price of these Chinese for-profit educators as the CCP turned them into not-for-profit businesses overnight. It is roughly estimated that there are over 10 million employees in the out-of-school tutoring industry. It is expected that a significant number of these people will be laid off, many of which have already been terminated with as little as two months salary. A tiny reprieve is that some of these people have turned to the underground tutoring industry as they've gotten jobs as house sitters or live in child care providers for wealthier families. Of course, these jobs would be fewer than those available previously in the education industry. So the net result is that there is a significant amount of people that lost employment overnight from this ban and have flooded the ranks of those that are unemployed right now in China. One point of note is that those tutoring jobs paid more than your average factory work. So these people may be hesitant to find work in the factories. Now moving on to the third of the three issues causing a shrinking industry is the slowdown in the Chinese real estate sector. I made a four part series assessing the turmoil in the Chinese real estate sector which I will link to at the end of this video. You need to understand what is going on and what I've done is in that four part series I've made it in an easy to understand manner to show you just how bad this can get. So please watch that series if you already have it. And the Coles notes are that overall there are large developers that are over leveraged and oversold properties that are not able to deliver on their obligations both on debt servicing and home development. The Chinese government has stepped in and is playing its part to remedy the situation, but they are thus far not admitting that the industry is likely in a crisis and requires a serious bailout. There are estimates that suggest that the number of workers in China's real estate industry is around 56 million people. This includes workers from developers, builders, and real estate agents. This estimate does not include those who are upstream and downstream from those businesses. So the real impact would be a multiple of that 56 million, which could include hits to suppliers of raw materials, industrial and finished product providers, banking and financial institutions, and design companies to name a few industries. If you don't understand this risk right here, you should not be investing in China. Luckily for you, as I said earlier, I will link to the four part series that I made on this situation at the end of this video. Now moving on to the migration moves. China has a population of around 180 million migrant workers who reside some of the year in the poor rural neighborhoods, but work most of the year in the cities. Before the pandemic, the number of such workers increased by two or three million each year. According to official data, Lu Feng, an economist at Peking University in Beijing, estimates that there's a six million person gap between the number of migrants currently working in cities and the pre-pandemic trend. So it looks like there are 6 million fewer people employed or just over 3% of the pre-pandemic figure. At first glance, this might not seem like a lot, but remember that if these people are not working in seemingly higher paying jobs near the cities, then these rural Chinese citizens are not emerging from poverty, which is exactly what China is banking on for further economic growth. Now, finally, when discussing dropouts, it's important that we note that this is an issue being experienced in the West as well. The official jobless survey defines unemployed people as those who have actively sought a job within the past three months and would be able to start a job within two weeks. China has placed hundreds of thousands of people in quarantine, usually for weeks at a time, as part of the coronavirus control efforts since the summer of 2021. Those people wouldn't meet the second condition and would not be counted amongst those that are unemployed. And because of the weak labor market, record numbers of young people are preparing to take exams that qualify for postgraduate courses or enter the civil space. The number of people sitting for those exams in 2021 rose by more than 1.6 million people from 2019, as economists at Minxing Securities Coast stated in a note. They would not be counted as job seekers, and so what you're seeing here is that the actual employment pressures of college students is higher than the unemployment rate suggests. So overall, what I'm suggesting is there are pandemic-related strains on the consumer purchase power that are happening as a result of the post pandemic measures. Now guys, I put out very comprehensive due diligence on companies and do quite a bit of news commentary. I even offer free classes which hundreds of you have taken thus far. To make sure that you don't miss out on any of that content on this channel, please consider subscribing to the channel, 
and hitting that notification bell so you don't miss out on anything. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to understand what is going on in the real estate sector in China. And I made an easy to understand series to show you just how bad this can get. So in order to watch that series, you can click into this video right here.